Coming up on Tech News Today, the truth about the Xbox One reviews. Also, uh, mining Bitcoins could get you fined and why the carriers don't want to protect your phone from theft, at least not the way you might want to. All that and more coming up. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by CashFly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Tech News Today for Wednesday, November 20th, 2013. Tech News Today is brought to you by ProXPN. ProXPN is a virtual private network that allows you to use the internet the way it should be, anonymously and without oversight. For 20% off your new account, go to ProXPN.com slash twit and use the code TNT. And by Squarespace, the all-in-one platform that makes it fast and easy to create your own professional website or online portfolio. For a free trial and 10% off, Go to squarespace.com and use the offer code TNT11. Welcome to Tech News Today. I'm Tom Merritt. I'm Sarah Lane. I'm Maya Zetter. I'm Jason Howell. And we're going to make it rain bitcoins of Woo! news today. Starting with the top 10 stories of the day in the news fuse. The Xbox One comes out this Friday, November 22nd, in 13 markets around the world, and the reviews came pouring out today. Most of them agree that, as you might guess, it's just never a good idea to buy a product right at launch, and the Xbox One's no exception. Uneven voice control was cited by many reviewers. Others picked at the interface and some of the functionality, saying it's not quite complete. But all the reviewers felt or at least all the ones I read, that the new Xbox has a lot of potential, and while Sony's PS4 may have the advantage out of the gate, the Xbox One might be the better bet in the long run. Qualcomm has new processors today. We've got a top-of-the-line Snapdragon 805. It's geared at mobile devices and 4K Ultra HD TVs. It's designed to, quote, deliver the highest quality mobile video, imaging, and graphics experiences. That's from Qualcomm. We've also got a Gobi 9X35. It's a fourth-gen 4G LTE modem, which also runs 3G and other wireless technologies. Qualcomm also introduced a new RF transceiver chip, the WTR3925, says that the chip's offer significant improvements in performance, power consumption, and printed circuit board area requirements. Because Apple wants to make it as easy as possible for you to part with your money, the company just introduced a new Apple Store app for iPad. This is an iPad native app that lets you buy Apple products, sign up for events, and schedule Genius Bar appointments. However, the in-store features of the iPhone app are not included in this iPad version. Russia's email provider Mail.ru has launched a U.S. product called My.com. Three services called My Mail, My Chat, and My Games are available as apps for Android and iOS for free. The Mail app can manage multiple accounts, including Gmail, Yahoo, and Outlook, among others. The Chat app, as you might expect, gives you free text messages, voice messages, and video calls. And the game app, as you might expect, gives you free games. You also get a free new buzzword as my.com calls their new platform communitainment. Ew. Yeah. Samsung lawyers have accused counsel for Apple of making racist arguments in an ongoing trial over smartphone patents and are calling for a mistrial. Harold Mc McGillany, Apple's attorney, spoke yesterday of a memory as a child watching TV on American-made sets and how intellectual property could have saved these products. He then said, quote, we all know what happened. Now, he counters the mistrial demand by telling U.S. District Judge Lucy Coe, I did not say a word about race and I did not say Asian. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, I know. Yeah, tough one. And a totally different story. AT&T, Verizon, Sprint, T-Mobile, and U.S. <laughs> Cellular have all turned down Samsung's proposal to preload its phones with absolute low-jack anti-theft software. The software would have allowed the carriers to remotely brick a phone if it was reported stolen or lost. The wireless carriers claim that a kill switch won't work as a solution because it could be misused by hackers who could disable someone else's phone. The New Jersey Attorney General fined eSports Entertainment for using players on its service to mine bitcoins. Uh, we talked about this back when it was first announced in May. The company included code in a software update that was installed on around 14,000 computers and minted 30 bitcoins. 
The company told Wired in May that the code was injected by an employee without their approval, and that employee has since been terminated. Esports Entertainment also faces a class action suit in California. A team at the Technical Institute of Physics and Chemistry in Beijing say that they can print electronic circuits on a range of materials using just an inkjet printer filled with liquid metal. They've demonstrated the technique on paper, on plastic, glass, rubber, cotton cloth, even a leaf. The liquid metal is an alloy of gallium and indium, which, at, which is liquid at room temperature. They pump it in through an inkjet printer and create a fine spray of liquid metal droplets that settle onto the substrate and create almost any circuit pattern. Wow. Fine spray of liquid metal droplets is my craft work cover band. <laughs> Ars Technica reports the Wikimedia Foundation issued a cease and desist letter to WikiPR demanding that the company immediately halt editing Wikipedia, quote, unless and until WikiPR has fully complied with the terms and conditions outlined by the Wikimedia community. Wikimedia alleges that WikiPR markets paid advocacy editing services in violation of Wikipedia policies. The Logitech iPhone game controller enclosure is now official and it has a spiffy name of PowerShell. It costs about 100 bucks. It's compatible with the iPhone 5S, iPhone 5, and the fifth generation iPod Touch. So if you got a 5C, this won't work. The PowerShell also packs a 1500 milliamp hour battery that will charge your phone on the go. This episode of Tech News Today is brought to you part by Pro XPN. You are scared. Maybe you're not that scared, but you should be. You should be a little concerned, maybe not scared, about your security. Especially, you know, you're, you hear the big headlines about the spying and the, the, the people looking at your packets. And you know what you really should be more concerned with is the everyday spies. The guy over there in the coffee shop who's, who's just looking like he's just like checking his email. He might be scanning your packets. If you are connected to an open Wi-Fi access port, whether it's at the, the shop or the burger store or at the airport or the hotel, there's somebody that might be looking at what traffic is going over that Wi-Fi network. And they might be trying to get your Facebook password or some other password, even worse, your banking password. You want to use a VPN, virtual private network, works with almost any internet connection and creates a secure encrypted tunnel through which all of your online data passes back and forth. One of the ones I use is Pro XPN. They're great. They got a lot of servers to choose from around the world. So people won't even know what part of the planet you're on, much less what's going through your private 512-bit encryption tunnel. And it works by OpenVPN or PPTP. Uh, you can you can get Windows and Mac software. You can configure it uh, for Linux. It also works with your iOS or Android device. Uh, in fact, there's a brand new Android app in the Google Play Store that supports OpenVPN. They got great support. Steve Gibson from Security Now even gave it a great review. That's what convinced me. Uh, go try it out yourself. ProXPN.com slash twit. You can get more information and sign up. ProXPN premium accounts are normally $9.95 a month or $74.95 for an entire year, but we've got a special offer. Use the code TNT to receive 20% off for the lifetime of your account. It's less than five bucks a month on the yearly plan. And if you're not satisfied, you can cancel within seven days for a full refund. So go to ProXPN.com slash twit and sign up with the code TNT. We thank ProXPN for their support of Tech News Today, and I thank them for being my VPN provider. All right, let's welcome in our guest around the old round table to discuss some of the stories of the day. Mike Wolf, analyst and host of the Next Market podcast, uh, which I was uh, happy to be a guest of recently. It was a good time talking to you and David Spark, man. Good podcast you guys got. How you doing, guys? Thanks for having me. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we've got uh, some good stuff to talk about. Xbox One review roundup. Uh, everybody's got the reviews out right now. Nobody's saying go out and buy the Xbox One, uh, just like nobody was saying go out and buy the PS4. They're all saying, hey, it's early days. But here's what some of the things they're saying are. Uh, CNET said there's uneven voice control. A lot of the reviews uh, reflected that. The Verge said nearly everything that could be great someday isn't great right now, voice control being one of those, but some of the other features as well. Uh, Kachaku echoed that, said there are so many rough edges, the software feels incomplete. And Gizmodo agreed with all of those sorts of things. The Gizmodo review, though, points out if the Xbox One can straighten the few little quirks it has with some software tweaks, in Gizmodo's words, this thing is going to be unstoppable in a way the PS4 could never touch. 
So, Mike, I don't know if you're—I don't know if you're a gamer, if you're considering getting game consoles, but uh, even if you're not, that's what Microsoft wants. They want to plug, want you to plug your cable system into this. They want to make it your entertainment box. Is this at all attractive to you? Yeah, well, you know, I, I was actually at launch day when they unveiled it in Redmond, and you know, I've been watching very closely. It's—it's it's a much different story for Xbox this time. You know, they weren't the incumbent uh, last time. It, PS3 was, Sony was, and I think that they are. So there's higher pressure on them. But I think everyone knows that with a game console, they really don't get their legs until the third or, third or fourth year. And oftentimes developers don't know how to tap into the potential. And when you look at the Xbox One, it's got that native connect support where there's a connect with every console going out. Uh, it's got native voice control. So I think those are new things that developers are going to have to take a while to play with. And I think by you know 2015, we're going to see some pretty cool games. I think Mike's on the ball with that because the first generation games on these consoles always look like the best version of the last generation games. There might be some improvements, but for all the features that the Xbox One is supposed to boast, this heavy reliance on using the Kinect, that, that's Microsoft you know, going all in with this device because these interfaces aren't necessarily that navigable with a controller. If your voice is supposed to be the real controller, that's a big deal. And the inconsistencies that I've been seeing in the reviews when it comes to how the voice controls work seem to be something that'll be worked out over time. Something like Xbox on turns on the device, turns on the device, but you have to say Xbox turn off instead of Xbox off. So there's some, and then confirm on top of it, some, right? Yeah, it's so some, Microsoft. There's so much language uh, language issues so far with this. If they're going to rely on voice, they're going to have to fix that over time. And I'm figuring, I think 2015 probably be really awesome. Just like the the Xbox 360 got better and better over time. If this is their first go around, looks pretty good. Sarah, any temptation well, to plunk down $500 for this thing and use it as your Netflix machine? No, uh, that's, I mean, yeah, I, I, I'm not really doing a lot of gaming. So because of that specific reason, uh, especially if someone's like, well, you know, there's some janky stuff, voice control, for example, not really working as, as, as it should. I, I think it's, Yes, I understand that any new, uh, you know, combination of hardware and software might have some rough edges, but I don't know, this seems like it's such a long time coming and finally the Xbox One is getting some reviews and and no one really thinks that anybody should get one just yet. I, that's, it's pretty anticlimactic. Yeah, I don't know. I, I feel like you're right. This time more than ever, there's less of a, this is the one to get and more of a, you know what, they're both in the early stages. But I don't know if that's because these consoles are any more buggy than early consoles. And remember the red ring of death uh, with mm -hmm. the Xbox 360. I think it's more that the tech press has just matured <laughs> over the years and they're less likely to get all breathless about new products and say, hey, for most of you out there, you probably want to wait until the bugs are worked out. And, and remember, it's $500. It's five hundred dollars yeah, exactly. out of the gate. It's a it's it's not a you know it's not a cheap console. And what's interesting is the PS4 is four hundred dollars, and then you have to pay an extra sixty bucks if you want to get the camera. That's still cheaper than the Xbox One, which makes you get the camera. You can't opt not to, uh, and is still more expensive even than that that bundle with the PS4. I just want to thank the early adopters out there for your service in running these things through through their hoops and going through the flashing blue light of death with the PS4. Whatever bugs are going to happen with the Xbox One, because you can count on it, there's going to be something out there uh, after launch. That's just the way new hardware goes. And then, yeah, in a month or two, I think we'll, we'll get a clearer picture of what the advantages and dis disadvantages of these two things are. Let's talk Bitcoins. Yeah. Sarah's very excited to talk about points. Uh, they, of course, esports uh, uh, getting fined was the story that we can hook this on that we heard in the news views. Yeah, so Esports Entertainment Association, or ESEA, uh, has, has, has reached a settlement with a New Jersey attorney general based on the company infecting about 14,000 of its customers well, their computers, with code to mine Bitcoins and in the process got about 30 Bitcoins over two weeks last spring. Last spring, I mean, the, the timing is relevant because it used to be a lot easier to mine Bitcoins than it is now. Now, the company, as you mentioned, Tom, in the news view says, we just there was an employee who did it. He went rogue. Nobody else was in on it. He's since been fired. The company said in a statement, quote, what transpired the past two weeks is a case of an employee acting on his own without authorizations to access our community through our company's resources. That's co-founder Craig Levine talking to Wired. 
Now, they're being fined anyway. The fine is for $1 million, but actually ESCA only needs to pay 325000 of it up front and then basically act right for 10 years. If, they, if they're, you know, smooth sailing for a decade, they avoid the rest of the fine. So really it's, you know, just kind of over 25%. Hopefully Attorney the General's can last 10 years, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Attorney General's office uh, has called the software a botnet, said that, you know, you're monitoring customers even when they weren't using your software, a total no-no. And what's interesting is, is that the Attorney General's office has kind of a different story. They say not only was uh, this particular software engineer who, who has been dismissed, but also co-founder Eric Thunberg, they were both in on it. That's a that's 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 basically what it says. Now, ESCA's site says, well, hold on, we you know uh, we, we don't want you to think that our co-founder was in on this, and that the attorney attorney general has a deep misunderstanding of this case and how technology works and blah blah blah. So, thirty bitcoins that got mined back in the spring at today's rates comes to about seventeen thousand dollars. Seems like it could be some pocket change, but then again, with the fine, they're obviously ending up in the red. I don't know. Michael, do you think that this is probably happening in a lot of other places? Who's next? Yeah, forget counterfeiting. Let's just start mining Bitcoin <laughs> by ins inserting kind of a secret code into all these app downloadable apps. No, I mean, I think there's a lot of legitimacy by investors looking at virtual currencies in terms of let's find a way to make money off of this. Let's look at new businesses. But I think this ty these types of stories I think are going to continue to scare people away from things like Bitcoin because if they can't get their arms around it, uh, then you know it could be a problem. So I think it's it's probably smart for them to try to prosecute when they can, even if it's a relatively small dollar amount, because I think that there are legitimate companies. There's investors looking at virtual currencies, and pr it's quite honestly, thinking this is uh, thinking of this as the future. Did the bitcoins get seized or something? I thought I remembered that, but I couldn't find anything in the, in the stories today about who is in possession of the Bitcoins at this point. Yeah, uh, that's a very good question. Where would the Bitcoins go? Because, yeah, I mean, this is, you know, they, they've reached a settlement, they've gotten fined. I mean, maybe, maybe the $17,000 value of the Bitcoins goes towards their fine, but no, that doesn't make any sense, you know, because you're, it, the idea that, I mean, I that'd kind be of, That'd be one of the best news all week for Bitcoin is that you could pay your, your criminal fines with them. <laughs> with with what you've mined thus far, yeah. yeah. The, the funny thing about this is, you know, I don't advocate doing anything like this. This is definitely a company in the wrong, but I mean, it's kind of brilliant in a way. I mean, you've got a bunch of like hardcore gamers, many of them who have uh, computers who are capable of, of uh, you know... Um, crunching a lot of data. I mean, Bitcoin mining is not easy. Um, and you, you know, you sprinkle a bunch of code and you've got all this stuff happening in the background. It's just, you know, it's just, I feel like it's a matter of time before we hear of, uh, of a lot more companies that, you know, are, are doing this and, and, and maybe we won't hear about the ones who are doing it better. Well, there are only a maximum of 21 million Bitcoins that can be mined. And I don't know how far we are down that road. I think there is a place where you can, you can find out how many are in circulation. But once you hit the 21 million, the Bitcoin system stops. And they don't, right. you can't mint anymore. So, so this, is a, uh, this is a limited term game that people have to race to get to. And, and you hear about people uh, running Beowulf clusters and, 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 and distributed computing schemes but this is this is one of the most dodgy. This is one of the dodgiest ones that I've seen. Yeah. Well, I'm not going to be asking for my salary in Bitcoin anytime soon. Uh, but I will be asking my carrier why I can't have a kill switch on my smartphone. Uh, San Francisco DA George Gascon, New York Attorney General Eric Schneiderman, uh, uh, law enforcement people from London and Philadelphia and others calling for anti-theft kill switches on phones. I heard about that in the news fuse. One in three robberies involved phone theft in the United States, according to the FCC. Android has anti-theft. It's the ability to remotely locate and wipe a stolen phone. Now, it doesn't have activation prevention. Uh, Samsung wants to do that. They want to preload absolute low jack on your phone. And iOS 7 has activation lock. Your phone can't be reactivated without knowing your Apple ID and your password. AT&T, Verizon, US Cellular, Sprint, and T-Mobile all have said nope. We are removing anti-theft from our versions of Android, and we are not allowing Absolute Lojack to be pre-installed on our phones. They say they worry that hackers could disable phones. And in one statement I read, they even tried to make it sound like these hackers could get into military and law enforcement phones 
uh, and, and steal the data. So they're trying to turn it on its head, saying it's more of a risk than a protection. Uh, critics say, you know what the carriers are worried about? They're worried about losing that insurance money that they get every, uh, every month from people as an anti-theft procedure. And the CTIA, to its credit, is working on a stolen phone database. That doesn't protect against your data being stolen, but it could protect against activation of the phone in the United States. But a lot of people say, well, then all the criminals will do is they'll send their phones overseas where that activation database is not in effect. So, Mike, where does that leave us? Uh, should the, are the carriers just being evil here, or do they have some some point that that this could be a risky thing to do anti? -theft? Yeah, it seems like a pretty flimsy excuse. I mean, I think what uh, what can't hackers get into if they really set their mind to it? And I think that I'm going to have to side with the attorney general on this. And it seems like they're maybe using it as an excuse to protect those uh, those recurring insurance fees you have to pay every month. It definitely yeah, sounds, like it. The, it sounds like the argument, like, you know, we must ban knives because they can be used by killers. It's like, okay, that's a little bit much. I think if you had the software preloaded, if anything, uh, maybe maybe these carriers want to charge extra money to have their own tracking software. But if you had this stuff on there and you could, you could break your phone uh, using this standardized software, it would be a benefit to uh, just pretty much any consumer because the idea is that people there's a lot of theft. People just grab a phone. If they just see it laying around, they can sell it. Uh, so if that's going to stop theft, I don't know if anything will actually stop theft, especially because there will be a, an eventual workaround to the bricked phone and you'll be able to have a new game. But that doesn't mean that you shouldn't take precautions now anyway. Sarah, anything? Any? Uh, yeah, I, I think we I think we are all in agreement here, unless, unless you're going <laughs> to shock me here. No, <laughs> I'm not, not going to shock you. Uh, wireless carriers are evil. Um, <laughs> It is. It's, it's absolutely ridiculous to say like this anti-theft provision could be used by hackers and Mike nailed it. It's because hackers can get into anything. Well, we shouldn't we shouldn't have any kind of logins then because people can steal your login and then be able to log into your things like come on that, that that's just ridiculous. Uh, thumbprints next, you know. And yeah, I mean, the fact is. They can already hack into your phone and wipe your data without anti-theft protection, theoretically. Um, so this this is ridiculous, and I think it's unconscionable that they're removing it, that they're resisting it. It's one thing for them to say we're not going to put it on ourselves, but if Samsung comes along, Android comes along, and says we would we're going to put this on the phone, and they're like, nope, take it off, can't run it on our network with that, and it's all five of them. Uh, that's just absolutely ridiculous. There are people who swear they're not members of the phone companies who say that, that the reason isn't the insurance. Uh, I want to know what the reason is then. If it's if it's not the insurance, it, it, you know, this is just then it's just even stupider that they're they're worried about management or some kind of ephemeral risk. Let's take a break and thank our sponsor for today's show, Squarespace.com. Constantly improving their platform, making your site beautiful, making it look good on mobile. Uh, if you're not using Squarespace for your website. Not sure why. Uh, why don't you go check them out? They're easy to use, incredibly easy to use. They're available 24 hours a day, seven days a week to answer a question if you've got one. And they're inexpensive. You get the hosting, the reliable hosting, the search engine optimization, the templates, uh, the, the mobile-ready designs, all for $8 a month, including a free domain name if you sign up for a year at a time. Every, and that domain name is yours to keep, by the way. You don't lose it after the year. That's your domain name. Every design automatically includes a unique mobile experience, that matches the overall style of your site so your content looks great on phones, on tablets, on desktops, on laptops. Start a trial today. Go do it right now. Don't even have to wait. You can open another tab in your browser. You can open your phone and do it there. Start a trial. No credit card required. Start building your website from your phone. They have an app. When you decide to sign up for Squarespace, make sure to use the offer code TNT11 to get 10% off and to show your support for Tech News Today. We thank Squarespace all the time for their support of Tech News Today. Why don't you thank them too? Squarespace, everything you need to create an exceptional website. Google's uh, expanded their app development kit to, to be useful, <laughs> some might say. Yeah, for Google Glass. like They already had the Mirror API, which made sure that uh, your phone was always working with Google Glass, but they took the wraps off, uh, off its... Glass developer kit or development kit. The GDK is different than Mirror. Now, apps can run in offline mode. They can get real-time user responses, and they can take advantage of Glass's hardware, like the GPS and gyroscope that's built right in. Uh, Timothy Jordan, Google's senior develop, uh, development advocate, said, if you're an Android developer developing for Glass, uh, this will feel natural. GDK also allows live cards and are a focused, immersive experience. So there's a lot of 
and a lot of the video demos is like a, a like a black screen. You see the white text because you're supposed to be enjoying what you're seeing. And they showed a bunch of demos, including word lens. So in the demo, we're going to show a video of that. Uh, somebody with Google, Google Glass is looking at a sign that's written in German. And as he's looking at the sign, the text on the warning sign changes from German to English. And then it warns him to tell him that it's a mountain path, enter oh. your own danger. I mean, obviously, the translation is not 100%, but now you have an idea of what it says. And another good app demo, they showed off uh, all the cooks. It's a cooking demo where you can actually see recipes as you are trying to cook. So instead of going back and forth to a tablet or a phone, you could just look slightly up and move back and forth, see the steps right there. Mike, does this seem to make Google Glass seem like more of a consumer device than before? Because before it seemed like it's this real edge case, nerdy kind of thing. But now it seems to have this kind of real world usage that could be could have a mass appeal. Well, let's be clear. It's still nerdy, but I think um, this actually taps into more of the kind of the baseline and the core capabilities. And you remember in 2007 when all the really, really smart kids were developing iPhone apps? I think the smart kids now are developing wearable apps, right? And there hasn't been a big uh, push towards like a wearable app store. But I've talked to some uh, app developers actually focusing in on Google Glass. So I think if you are an app developer, you don't want to try to get, get above the noise of a million apps in the mobile app space around iPhones and Android. I would be looking at wearables and I'd be trying to get a hold of this SDK. And that's the essential reason that, that Google's trying to make this very easy for Android developers to make the transition over so that those those smart wearable developers that you're talking about uh, don't have any objections. They go, oh, wow, you know, I can take the skill set and I can transfer it over. Can't transfer the app over necessarily. Uh, but let me tell you, that cooking uh, implementation oh, yeah. is the one that caught my eye. Instead I of do. having that iPad getting splashed or your Nexus 7 and you got grease all over your fingers, I guess you're going to get grease on the side of your glass a little bit maybe. But <laughs> hands-free while I'm looking, that's amazing. Yeah, I think anything that you can use as a great example of, oh, I need to keep checking my reference material. Something like uh, um, uh, um, converting a language. What's the word I'm looking for? Translating? Translation. Translation. Translate, Translate you know, something where you're like, oh, okay, I've got a Back and forth, back and forth. Cooking mm -hmm. is another great example. Yeah, you were trying to follow a recipe, you kind of do something, and then you're like, okay, what's the next step? Anything that could be right in your peripheral vision that would help you move along, and there are a lot of other examples, but I think language and cooking are two very good ones. All of a sudden, I go, oh, cool, okay. That just makes my process of, you know, uh, making dinner that much more seamless. That's really neat. There's also a demo uh, for something called Strava for Glass, which actually, if you're if you're on a bike ride or a jog, you would constantly see the miles per hour and the distance you traveled on the left side of your Google Glass home screen. That kind of constant looking or constant feedback, I think, is a, is a great thing that Google Glass can give you that no other device can. Because if you're running, you got to look at your watch or you got to pull out a phone or you got it on your arm or something. It's very difficult to do that. I know a lot of people like to get lost in these kinds of things and eventually will look at their metrics on their phone. But to have this constant feedback or maybe motivators of things, that seems like it's it does provide something different than just taking out your phone because you have this augmented reality that this is the thing I've been looking for for Glass for the long time. Augmented reality where you have these overlays where you're actually still interacting with the world. You're not just kind of like constantly distracted by like, I'm looking up here, I'm looking up here. Look, there's a, tw a tweet. I really wanted to just augment what's going on. It's going to get easier for folks in the UK to register their domain names, but that's going to make it more complicated for a short period of time for people who already have domain names in the UK. Sarah, what, what's this all about? Yeah, you know, I've always thought, and hey, you know, I, I, we should probably ask Nate Langson or some, so, you know, one of right. our British friends, how much does this bother you? But I always felt that .co.uk seemed like, I mean... There's two periods in there. Doesn't that just seem annoying? We've got a dot .com. Can't it be easier? Uh, supposedly, it is going to happen. And this is actually something that has been uh, brought up by an organization called Nominate before. But it had kind of been shelved for a while because the whole thing, um, they were worried it would just be complicated and confusing uh, to people. But UK websites will soon be able to use just dot .uk rather than dot .co dot .uk or in addition to .co.uk. Uh, the decision will affect more than 10 million customers who are currently using domains that end in .uk, and that's where they feel like they have to tread really carefully. Now, Nominet's French and German equivalents, domain registrars, have already carried out a similar move. So 
it's been done, but then it can possibly get more expensive. That's what critics say. They say, well, businesses will want to keep their existing domains because you don't want to have something that all of a sudden just doesn't point to the company you're trying to reach. But then you want to buy the new ones because you'd want to prevent other competitors from buying them and hijacking traffic and, con and confusing your consumers. However, the price to change is really pretty reasonable. Middlemen domain registrars would be um, three pounds 50 for a single year contract, two pounds 50 a year for multi years. The organization had originally proposed uh, 20 pounds to, char uh, to charge for a year for new addresses. They've also extended the amount of time that customers have to decide whether they even want to pay for a shorter name. You basically get uh, a first right of refusal um, for five years. So, you know, you've got ICANN in the process of creating a bunch of new generic top-level domains. Nominate says they kind of have to do this in order to stay competitive. Michael, what do you think? Is it, is it, is it so ingrained, the .co.uk, that this seems unnecessary, or is this the right move? I'm with you. I've always thought that there's too many periods, .co.uk. So I think that there looks like they're giving those who own those domains uh, a good grace period to actually buy them. And quite honestly, if you're running a business online, uh, three pounds, uh, you know, ten dollars, whatever it costs, probably worth investing it. I only worry that people who are only tangentially or minimally involved with their websites may not be paying attention. And I think there's maybe a potential for opportunity down the road for people to kind of steal traffic if, uh, over time if they take these shorter domain names. I, I almost think they should just make it yours to keep. Right. Like you just you're granted this if you already have the .co.uk and then you have to pay to renew it. Uh, but you you just get it uh, yeah. and, and then you can decide to lose it. That would, yeah. But but I do think they 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 went a ways down that road by saying we'll give you five years. That's a lot of time uh, to give people. And they, they did the right thing because I do think that it makes sense for them to convert this. And there's always going to be problems if you have to convert a domain name. Yeah, short names are always better. I was thinking about the old domain name for states. Do you remember those like state, www.state.gov, like CA or something? It was really bizarre. So to, to, to simplify things so it's a more universal language, I guess that makes a lot more sense, especially if you're talking in the mobile world. You just want to type really quickly and get these things done. But then again, you're probably going to have tons of redirects anyway. So you're going to probably, assuming you can keep co.uk active, you're going to probably have both of them there because of SEO and a whole bunch of other stuff that would make you want to keep those things uh, running for the long run. Although then you get into the weird argument of like, well, if it's .uk, then why not .us for companies that, that's US-based? It's, it's, it's all, it's gotten kind of complicated. But I think, yeah, I think this is the best step. And Tom, I agree with you that really the company should just automatically get the shortened version, but it doesn't always work that way. Nominate wants to make some money. People have been saying for a long time that Nintendo should just get out of the game console business, get out of the hardware business, and just make games, port them over to, to tablets and stuff. Now there seems to be evidence that they're only taking that advice partway and possibly getting into the tablet business. Uh, Ayaz, what, what's, what seems to be going on here? This is becoming an intriguing development. So there was a series of Twitter posts saying that Nintendo is working on an Android tablet for educational games. Uh, the tweets came from Nintendo of America software engineer Nando Montezaro. Now, these tweets were collected by several different websites, but they have since been deleted. So if you try to find the original ones, they're gone. Uh, but the tweet said that uh, experimenting with a tablet of Nintendo, the system is based on Android, fully modified and unified as a database of the tablet, hashtag Android. Another tweet, at the moment, just testing communication environment of educational games that will be shared between the kids using the tablet, hashtag tablet. Those tweets are absolutely gone right now. So if you went to the these links, they're no longer active. So something's going on there. Venture Beat contacted Nintendo for confirmation, but got the standard, Nintendo doesn't comment on rumors or speculation. Nintendo wouldn't even comment if this guy was even working for Nintendo. Uh, but the fact that the tweets are gone make it a little bit more suspicious. Uh, Montezaro, at least somewhere in these tweets, said that Nintendo, Super Nintendo, and Game Boy games would not appear on the tablet, but educational games would be the focus. But they would have Nintendo characters like Mario and Luigi, Mike, Nintendo educational tablets, assuming this is even a thing that might come out, is this a good idea? You know, it's it's kind of sad how little part of the story Nintendo is for the current uh, new generation of consoles. Uh, they've seen slowing sales with the 3DS as they're getting from below from from tablet or, uh, or from, from tablet apps. So I think that they need to look at new markets. I think it's smart of them. They're probably looking at kind of eating into that leap, leap pad market, the leapfrog market. Um, 
for children's educational hardware. I think it's smart. Um, I think they need to make a move because I think their core hardware markets, they are, they're seeing huge uh, uh, declines in market share. I wonder what Nintendo, I mean, Nintendo's obviously up to something here. Uh, the guy does seem to actually work for Nintendo. Nintendo just doesn't want to comment on this at all. He, he's probably at the very least getting a, a stern talking to over posting these sorts of things on Twitter. If you look at his Twitter account, he's a talkative guy. He posts a lot. He seems to just be engaged on Twitter and he probably just got really excited about what he's been been coding and what he's been working on. Uh, and I think it would be an interesting experiment for Nintendo to say, we're going to take the characters of our universe, come up with an educational play that's good PR for us. It's good business because it's an enterprise level situation and one of the few enterprise level scale products that Nintendo could probably come up with right now. Uh, and it doesn't compete with their existing platform. It doesn't do anything to save the existing gaming platform. It's not taking games and porting them over to tablets, although maybe they could learn from that experience and, and extend that to their gaming platform later. But if this did, and again, it's just, uh, just some tweets from somebody, not an official announcement, but if it did turn out to be true that Nintendo was trying this, I think it would be very smart for them to say, hey, let's, let's have Mario help teach people in the classroom. Let's put Yoshi in there. Let's have Zelda uh, help, because kids love those characters. Yeah, but would Nintendo need to necessarily make hardware to do this, or could they just do this via software? Because the, the reports seem like it make, makes it seem like Nintendo is working on a piece of hardware, uh, which would make sense. Yeah. But... <clears throat> I, I, we have three tweets, right, to go on. So it's hard to tell if it's actually them building an internal prototype to test the software or them wanting to actually build a piece of hardware that's Android-based uh, and dedicated. They wouldn't have to. So it would make just as much sense if it turned out, well, yeah, they made a piece of hardware internally to test this on, uh, but they're really just going to produce the software. Yeah, it's hard to tell. I don't know if you want Yoshi teaching your kids stuff. I don't think he speaks English or actually much of any language. Does he? <laughs> I, lo I love the idea of beloved Nintendo characters, you know, helping teach kids in school. Kids would get a kick out of it, I, I guess. I mean, do do younger kids, kids care about the legacy Nintendo characters? Maybe that's a good way to sort of keep them in the, it, 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 you know, it, relevant. The building a Android tablet doesn't sound very likely to me. Why would Nintendo do that? They, but yeah, having something to test software on. They seriously foreshadowed this with Dr. Mario. I'm going to say that right now. This education market isn't just for little kids. It's for doctors. Medical school. <laughs> what? What? Where are you getting that from? Dr. Mario, the video game. You didn't play that? It was like Tetris with pills. It, <laughs> oh, I see what you're saying. So they're... Uh, it no, was a yeah, joke. Yeah. That's a joke. It's funny, I got to explain the joke. Son. It's not funny. Went over your head there, Merritt. <laughs> too, too sophisticated for me. I it's guess. too early. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> All right, let's fire up the randomizer. What do we got? Straw poll today, and I, I have to mention the number two with 44%. Cat Academy wants to help you learn new languages using pictures of cats. Didn't win, but you should know it exists. Uh, the winner of 56%, Bob Dylan's interactive Like a Rolling Stone video, uh, which The Verge has embedded, but you can also get it at Bob Dylan's website. It is, it is interactive in that you can have a different video play every time you watch it because you change the channel. Some of these are actually like Drew Carey hosting Price is Right, mouthing the words to Like a Rolling Stone while you hear the song. Uh, some of them are fake reality shows. Some of them are real reality shows. Some of them are fake sports reports. Some of them are real. Uh, it's, it's, it's kind of incredible, and it really has the look of these actual channels. The Property Brothers from Home and Garden are, look like they're just doing an episode where they're sitting talking on the phone, working on some stuff, but they're what's what their mouths are saying are the words of the Bob Dylan song. And of course the interactive bit is you can change the channel. You can go in there and press the little channel button and flip between all these things and it has a, an online guide looking thing like you're actually watching this on cable. Um, I, I was skeptical of this until I watched it. Once I started playing with it for a while, it really won me over. I, I actually got pretty uh, pretty into it. Did you guys take a look at this? Yeah, I think this is like, it's so weird. You know, it's one of these things where I'm like, I don't understand who made this up in their brain, but it's so cool in the execution that I don't even really care. What I think is weird is Price Center set there. Yeah. I think it's weird that it took Bob Dylan to maybe help us try and reinvent the the music video, which is like, what, yeah. 40 years old? 
And he right. comes back and says, guys, I'm tired of this format. Let's do something different. I don't know. It's gone too electric for me. This is, <laughs> this is a bit much for Bob Dylan. This isn't electric. This is one of the, the not electrics. <laughs> That's <laughs> seriously cool. It's ridiculously cool. A lot of, a lot of people uh, attribute the video, the music video kickoff to Bob Dylan because of the opening scene of Don't Look Back, the 1967 documentary. So I guess it could make sense in, in that respect. But go play around with it. It's really, it's really fun. Really cool. What's on the calendar, Sarah? Well, I mentioned yesterday that uh, today is Windows uh, Windows's birthday, but it's Happy also birthday. Xbox 360's birthday tomorrow. Oh, and I figured oh. it was worth talking about because we talked about the Xbox One at the beginning of the show. Launched back in 2005. It's been so long. Also tomorrow, uh, which is the 21st, uh, Pandora has its latest earnings report. All right. We got some emails. Don't Incoming we? message. Yes. And since we've got lots of emails, I will read just one from Rich from Lovely Cleveland. Tom and Posse, could Dropbox be raising this money to help transition away from relying on Amazon's S3 servers? As Dropbox expands into more enterprise and backend services, they would increasingly come into competition with Amazon. The $250 million raised would at least enable them to start building their own infrastructure. If Dropbox wants to expand past being a consumer product, albeit a really good one, I think they would want direct control on their scalability. Of course, this doesn't seem to bother Netflix, who's already in direct competition with Amazon and entirely lives on S3, so it might be a cost versus quality of service issue. Either way, I agree with Tom. As long as they don't screw up the basic functionality of their service, I'm happy. Me too, Rich. With you, hundred percent. I, I I think it's certainly something they would they would want to consider, or maybe maybe they consider like, hey, we're good at this consumer facing product. Maybe we'd pull an Amazon, keep our popular consumer facing product, but also create an enterprise level uh, solution. Maybe they become an S three competitor. There's all kinds of things they could do there. Well, that is it for this episode of uh, Tech News Today. Mike Wolf, uh, again, thanks for having me on the Teardown Show uh, a while back. That was really fun. And uh, tell folks about not, not just that, but the next market show you do and anything else got, you got going on. Yeah, I'm, a, I'm an analyst by trade. Been doing it for a, probably too long. I used to work at GigOM, help GigOM set up their research group. And uh, I'm on, out on my own. I do a podcast. And uh, it's uh, the next market podcast. You can find it at iTunes. Check it out nextmarket.co. By the way, well done on GigaOM Pro. Because frankly, I was a little skeptical when that first launched. And it's it's a very valuable product that does it right. Where yeah, like it charges you, know, you for the things that are worth paying for. <laughs> yeah, the research business, uh, I've been in it for a long time and it's pretty expensive. So I thought we went to GigaOM, I went to GigaOM, we tried to disrupt things a little bit. And I think we did. I think it disrupted the market research business a little bit. Thanks a lot, Michael Wolf, nextmarket.co. Uh, also, don't forget, folks, that you can vote on our subreddit, technewstoday.reddit.com, if you'd like to have an effect on the stuff that we choose each and every day. Get in there, submit some links, vote, vote them up, vote them down. It's all good stuff in there. You can also email us, tnt at twit.tv. Give us a call, leave us a voicemail, 260-TNT-SHOW. We have a YouTube channel you can subscribe to. If you're a YouTuber, go to Tech News Today at the YouTube channel. It's youtube.com slash technewstoday. And, of course, find our podcast subscription links, our show notes, all that stuff at twit.tv slash TNT. We'll be back tomorrow with CNET's Stephen Shankland as our guest. See you then. <laughs> that was epic wow. dancing, Sarah. I mean, really, Sam? I, I, it's that yeah, sweatshirt. It you got to get so clean, you know?